Hi there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. There are no spoilers in this video from episode three of Ahsoka. New Republic has a big, big problem. You might have noticed it in The Mandalorian and it's becoming even more glaring in the Ahsoka series. I like to call it the intoxication of peace to be a little poetic, you know? And what it is, is a culture and a series of policies made by New Republic leaders that would ultimately define the course of the government in the post-galactic civil war period. Now, in order to understand the New Republic we see in Ahsoka, which takes place in 980Y, we have to skip back a few years to the end of the Battle of Endor, just five years earlier. And as usual, to get to the more juicier lore and background information, we have to dig into the novels of Star Wars. Before The Force Awakens even came to theater, the first book in what would be known as the Aftermath Trilogy would come out. It was an interesting read and detailed events that occurred between the original trilogy and sequel trilogy from the point of view of several members of the New Republic. It's not my favorite book, but if you guys are interested in learning about this period of time and you like galactic politics, it's a pretty good read. It's not like Darth Plagueis level, but it is very interesting. And there's not just the Aftermath trilogy, there's also a standalone novel called Bloodlines, which is pretty good. Now, I remember being surprised by what I read when those books came out. Things were falling apart rapidly for the Empire. The first Aftermath novel took place just months after the Battle of Endor. The Empire had split into warring factions, just like in the EU, but there was also a shadowy hand pulling the puppet strings behind the scene, a protege of the supposedly deceased Palpatine. And this puppeteer was essentially walking Imperial forces into trap after trap and just helping the Imperial Navy get demolished by the increasingly formidable New Republic Navy. It's almost as if this puppeteer wanted the Empire to be destroyed. What's even more interesting is what's going on with Chancellor Mon Mothma, the heart of the Rebellion, which would actually be renamed the New Republic shortly after the Battle of Endor. Mon Mothma would become the first leader of this fledgling government, and once again, her compassion and desire for peace would reign supreme. Mon Mothma was a terrific leader for the Rebel Alliance and New Republic. She was cautious, studious. In a previous video, we actually went over her detailed and thorough notes on the military strategy and tactics utilized by the Rebel Alliance. To sum it up, despite being a politician and legislator for most of her life, she seemed to have actually listened in all of those Senate committee hearings about the Empire's military strategy and allocation of resources. She also picked up some new hobbies like studying uh, military tactics, logistics, and also uh, military history. The point is, she's a really serious person. And she put her job above everything else. And she always tried to be prepared. And her intimate understanding of what the alliance to restore the Republic's military capabilities were ultimately allowed her to wait for the right opportunity to strike. The victory at Scarif is what really turned the alliance into a full-on rebellion. This was a very calculated and disciplined move by Mon Mothma, and I think she did a great job not wasting the very limited resources and manpower the Rebellion had on some lesser targets, which is something more hot-headed military leaders might have done, like Saul Guerrero or even Admiral Raddus. In many ways, she was the perfect person for that moment in history. But like any human being, um, every positive leadership trait she might have also had some uh, negative sides to it as well. If you believe in fate, then you might believe that we are all destined to be at our peak performance and usefulness in a very small window, when an individual's personality, skill, and opportunity are perfectly suited for a specific task. Most of us miss that window in our life and we never fulfill our full potential, but I guess that's okay. But Mon Mothma did not, and her time to shine spanned from the moment she fled the rebellion up until the Battle of Endor. But like many great and well-intentioned people, she overstayed her welcome. She was in a leadership position perhaps for too long. In times of great chaos and suffering, her optimism and compassion were exactly what the rebels needed. But in the messy aftermath of the Galactic Civil War, those same traits created a lot of big problems. And it all came down to her ideology. Now during the war, Mon Mothma wanted to be on the front. She wasn't a coward. But she was also too priceless to the rebellion to be risked by being placed on the front. And Mon Mothma was a deeply empathetic and benevolent person. As much as she tried to rationalize the cost of war, as many leaders have to, her lack of combat experience meant that she was never desensitized to the violence of war. We see this in the years leading up to the Galactic Civil War and her interactions with Luthen Rael. Although she was ultimately committed to the war effort and more than willing to risk her own life, the thought of risking other people's lives and the thought of other people dying was not something she was really ready to accept. The Empire has been choking us so slowly we're starting not to notice. The time has come to force their hand. People will suffer. 
That's the plan. A rebellion like the one the New Republic successfully pulled off has many different stages, and at each stage, you need different types of people uh, functioning in different positions. Luther Ryle was that person during those earlier years, when the Empire's grip on the galaxy was firm and it was slowly draining liberty and hope from the populace through bureaucracy and a culture of apathy. Some might call it the banality of evil. If you don't go looking for the problems that are happening, you might just miss it completely. Now, Luther Ryle probably won't live to see the actual rebellion in full swing, as he will have served this purpose, and perhaps he's also burned too many bridges. But the lesson he tries to teach Mon Mothma about the sacrifices needed for a successful rebellion, unfortunately, went unheard. Mon Mothma never really develops a taste for blood, which is probably a good thing in some ways. But just weeks after the Battle of Endor ended, Mon Mothma was touring a destroyed village on the planet of Nalol. She saw how just one small battle could change the local population's life forever. Perhaps a part of her began to question whether the cost of victory over the Empire was actually better than the cost of living under authoritarian rule. It's at this point that Mon Moth would start drafting the Military Disarmament Act. It was a pledge that when hostilities ended between the Empire and the New Republic, the New Republic military forces would voluntarily reduce the size of both their navy and ground forces by 90%, leaving just a small token force in the core to react to any larger threats. The funds that were used to pay for the federal military would be redistributed to local planetary defense forces. The Military Disarmament Act would pass in one of the first meetings of the New Republic Senate, which convened on Mon Motha's homeworld of Chandrilla. We're not really sure if Mon Motha wanted to lead the New Republic, but she was clearly the best choice, and she had a lot of respect. And in her first two terms, basically the Senate was completely hers. She was the George Washington of her time. But the Military Disarmament Act would pass while the war was still raging all across the galaxy. And while most people supported Mothma's measures, some people would oppose her, including her own aides and even Princess Leia, who hailed from the pacifist planet of Alderaan, which was now nothing but just some space dust. I think Mon Mothma made a huge strategic error by announcing her intentions so that her enemy can hear and basically plan for what they'll do next. I'm reminded of one of President Obama's bigger foreign policy mistakes. During the 2011 campaign, he promised to voters that he would withdraw American troops from Iraq in uh, late 2012. And of course, uh, the group that would one day become ISIS was watching this and they went to ground. They allowed the withdrawal to happen peacefully and then they just came out of nowhere, started raping and pillaging everywhere, destroying stuff. They made it into Syria. Now, this wasn't just Obama's fault, of course. This policy was initially enacted by George W. Bush. So, as you can see, both sides of the political divide were guilty of putting politics before sound military strategy. The New Republic, like these American leaders, were playing a different game from their enemies, who in their defeat only became slimmer, meaner, and more desperate for success. Mon Motha, like Deshaun Jackson, had spiked the football before even crossing the goal line. Interestingly enough, the New Republic Charter for the Chancellor was ripped straight from the Republic they were trying to restore. And that charter still maintained the same emergency powers that the Senate had given Palpatine all those years earlier during the Clone Wars. And so another thing that Mon Mothra would do during this period of time would be to relinquish her emergency powers and basically give up control of the military to a board of military leaders. It's very clear that Mon Mothma's policies from the Military Disarmament Act to the removing of her own emergency powers were directly related to her vivid memory of her time as a Republic Senator during the Clone Wars. She was a member of Palpatine's own Royalist Committee and was a part of the Senate that had ended term limits and given Chancellor Palpatine those emergency powers. Something that she would greatly regret and oppose for the duration of her tenure in both the Republic and Imperial Senate. Now, a year after her Military Disarmament Act was proposed, the Battle of Jakku would occur and the last major group of Imperial forces in the known galaxy were dispatched. The Galactic Concordance Treaty would be signed between Imperial and New Republic forces, which would basically end the war. It's pretty standard what was asked of the Empire, a cessation of all hostilities between the Empire and the Republic. Although Grand Vizier Masamita, the Imperial representative at that meeting, hardly had the authority to guarantee such a thing. The Empire would also seek control of Coruscant, which honestly had become extremely chaotic following the Battle of Endor. They also asked for the Empire to abandon its academies and completely disband their Stormtrooper Corps. At the same time, the New Republic made several concessions to make sure that the war would end quickly. This included granting mass pardons to most enlisted soldiers and also uh, giving pardons to non-combatants. 
However, officers who did not surrender directly to the New Republic were branded as war criminals and hunted down. Now, these are some great ideas, but whether the New Republic would be capable of enforcing these ideas is a completely different story. For instance, the Disarmament Treaty, which banned the Imperial Remnant from creating more stormtroopers, was easy to circumvent when the Imperial Remnant journeyed into the Outer Rim. In order to get around weapons sanctions, for instance, uh, companies like Blastech and Senior Fleet Systems just created uh, subsidiary companies outside of New Republic space, and these companies would supply the First Order military. So, as you can see, just like in real life, uh, sanctions don't really work that well. They're a very powerful part of the toolkit, but they shouldn't be your only way of stopping or preventing war. But don't tell that to the New Republic. We also shouldn't be mentioning the assassination attempts on Mon Mothma during the uh, peace treaty negotiations, or the hardliners that were basically blowing themselves up at New Republic uh, prisoner relocation centers. Imperial fanatics hated the New Republic, but they hated the Imperials who dared surrender even more. These things were ignored, as were pleas by Princess Leia's faction to at least maintain the current size of the New Republic Navy in case war breaks out again. And the New Republic Amnesty program that was supposed to rehabilitate Imperials and make them functioning members of society was fraught with corruption and incompetence. The sheer amount of Imperial operatives that were able to infiltrate the New Republic's Amnesty program and land positions in key administrative and even military offices is simply staggering. But then again, if you take a look at the line of questioning that New Republic psych droids gave to uh, surrendered Imperials, I'm not actually surprised at all this happened. Have you experienced any feelings of anger or resentment towards the New Republic government or its representatives? No. The New Republic tried really hard to continue its hearts and minds approach when dealing with surrendered Imperials. During the war, Mon Mothma believed that all the Rebellion needed was to show their strength and present a more reasonable and kind alternative to the Empire, and the masses would just come to their cause. And she was right. I mean, many Imperials like Dr. Pershing regretted their actions during the war and completely brought into the New Republic's message. He wanted to do something positive to show that he was no longer an Imperial. But of course, behind the New Republic's sunny disposition and kinder culture was the same internal mechanisms that ran the Empire and also the Republic before. This was a cold and unfeeling bureaucracy that cared very little for individual needs and desires. When Dr. Pershing spots some highly valued Imperial machinery that's slated for destruction because it's simply Imperial, he asks his supervisor if they can do something about it. Maybe save it. Straight can I be honest with you? We are really behind here. Not only do we have the Imperial Disposal Yards to inventory, but we're still decommissioning the Alliance fleet. I'm sure you understand. I just think I could be helpful if I could. It would require authorization from the department. You could submit a C-1023 request, but I've never seen someone from the Amnesty program make one of those. I'd have to check if that's even possible. But even then, there was a lack of consistency in New Republic policy. As we see in the Ahsoka series, when a Carillion shipyard formerly owned by Morgan Elsbeth is being stripped down for resources and sold for credits. And just like in the Amnesty program, the supposedly reformed company under new management still has many die-hard Imperials working in its ranks. How can they still be loyal to the Empire? It's not loyalty. It's greed. The incompetence of the New Republic would only grow as memories of the Galactic Civil War would fade. The New Republic would repeat the mistakes of the Old Republic. It would ignore its responsibilities for non-aligned territories like Navarro as pirates ransacked it. This was a perfect opportunity for the New Republic to increase its territorial holdings. And after Mon Mantha stepped down, things only got worse. Her successors lacked the political clout and charisma that she had and they weren't able to unify the government. And then partisanship would emerge as opportunists and power-hungry senators would create different factions. In total, there would be two factions. You would have the centrists and the populists. The centrists were for a stronger government, stronger military, and the populists were for basically uh, individual system rights. And decades later, the first post-galactic civil war generation would be born. They would never experience the horrors of AT-ATs and Star Destroyers appearing over your system and bombarding the landscape into a glassed over surface. And certain groups in this generation became fascinated with uh, Imperial memorabilia. They liked the regalia, the uniforms. Soon, Galactic Civil War Stormtrooper helmets and Imperial battle flags were being sold on the black market for exorbitant prices to collectors. And while for many this was an innocent endeavor that was fueled by genuine curiosity and probably a little bit of a misunderstanding of history, there was also a small minority that truly worshipped the Empire and pined for the days of its return. 
Some of these individuals would even uh, secure seats within the Senate and be placed in high positions of power within the new republic. And these individuals, of course, would erode the security apparatus even more. These were the individuals who most frequently called Princess Leia a war hawk for warning the galaxy about the First Order. As more and more people forgot about the horrors of the Empire and the Galactic Civil War, more and more individuals began to view authoritarianism in a very romantic and naive way. This, of course, has no small part to do with the failures and incompetence of the New Republic, but the suffering the galaxy went through under Palpatine is just not comparable. I think what's really great about the Star Wars series in general is its criticism of republics. You know, I'm a huge fan of democracy, representative democracies, and I believe that in order for these systems to work, we truly need to kind of understand the flaws of our system, be critical thinkers. I mean, that's what really separates an authoritarian dictatorship from a democracy. We have the ability to learn, to understand, to see all the flaws that are occurring, and we have the power to fix it and be active participants in what's going on. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.